we discussed many times, the Torah is divided into two parts. You have positive commandments, we have negative commandments. Positive commandments are do commandments, to do. Negative commandments are refrain. Don't do, refrain, withhold, do not cross those lines. Transgression is over transgression, that's a negative commandment. So therefore you must refrain not to violate the negative commandment. Every positive commandment is, whether it's putting on tzitzis, tefillin, observing the Shabbos, saying the Kiddush, eating matzah to Seder, sitting in the sukkah, taking the four species. These are all positive commandments. It's due. A human being possesses every one of us a certain inertia. To get yourself moving, you need motivation. We're pretty much fixed in where we want to be fixed. To be able to extricate ourselves from where we are to go to another place, you have to have a sufficient incentive. That's the whole value of incentives. A person would only go to work if it's worth working. Otherwise, who's gonna spend eight hours a day at the office if you have a choice not to go to the office? It's only because it's not just to be productive because there's earnings and a person has certain needs. So those needs forces a person to become productive. But if he wouldn't have the incentive to be productive, he wouldn't be productive because there's a natural inertia in every one of us. So to do, you need an impetus to do. What is the greatest impetus to do? What is the motivating factor which causes a person to move, to grow, to advance? Love. Avo. You love something, you want something, whether it's love which is contingent on something because you're gonna be a beneficiary, or it's love which is not contingent on anything, which is the ultimate love, because you appreciate the value of whatever you wanna be associated with it. With That love will motivate you to be able to achieve or attempt to achieve what you want to achieve. So Ava, which is the Hebrew word for Ava, is the all necessary ingredient for growth, for spiritual growth, for any growth. You want to make something of yourself? You go and you apply yourself. You have, you want to get a better grade to be able to have a better average to enter into a better university, to get a better degree. So the positions that will be off to you will be, have greater value, more prestigious, whether it's ego driven, whether it's financial driven, whatever it's driven. But that's what drives you is because you want something. Nobody loves anybody more than he loves himself. So whatever will accommodate our needs, our wants, our desires, that drives us. And that always gets us over the hump. Positive commandments in the Torah. To put on tefillin, to say Shema in its proper time, to articulate the words, to fulfill the obligation of Shema, those words have to be said as prescribed by the Torah and they have to be pronounced correctly. If you don't pronounce those words as the prescribed by the Torah to be pronounced, <coughs> although you say something which is a semblance of those words, one does not fulfill those mitzvah. So it takes a certain degree of effort, of focus, of articulation, of meticulousness to be able to do things which are right. So it has to be sufficiently valuable to the person to do it right. Otherwise, people do it in a very haphazard, sloppy way. 
there's an expression in the just in the vernacular. It's a sloppy job. Half baked, not sufficiently researched. You just want to be able to over with. But if a person truly has an interest in knowing and want to put out a first quality product, he will do his research and make sure to even consult on it to make sure it's, it is what it should be. The, there's a mitzvah called Avas Hashem, loving God. What do we do a mitzvah? What do we do what we do? Well, you can do something out of fear, because if you don't do it, you're gonna be punished. But if there's any moment that we feel that was somehow able to hoodwink God in our own minds, or was satisfied that we've done enough and there won't be any level of re recourse from God, we're gonna slack it off. But if the motivating factor to do the mitzvah is not fear that you can be punished if you don't do it, but rather it's love. If you truly do it out of love, you're not gonna slacken off. Of course, the love is there. And the, if the love for God is greater than the love for yourself, the love for God will surpass and supersede the love for yourself. And you can do it right. As much as you may wanna sleep later in bed and sleep beyond the time of the Shema and not go and pray with a minion, with a quorum. Or not go and do certain, purchase certain things. Or put on a pair of tefillin. Because you put them on four out of the seven days a week. Because I think God will be okay with that. But that's fear. As long as you feel you've met God's quota, God's, God's expectation. And beyond that, that's only you can be seen in a positive light. You know something? I can be um, agreeable to neutral. But if you, the motivating factor is love for God, as much as you do, you always want to do more because the incentive and the motivation to serve God is avo, is love. Therefore, love, avas Hashem, is something which is vital and fundamental to spiritual growth. And the first paragraph of the Shema, we find the positive commandment that a Jew must love God. You must demonstrate that love, which we'll discuss when we get to the words of the Shema at every level in our lives, whether it's feeling our hearts, no matter, regardless of the difficulty, we will do it because you love God with all your heart. You love God with all your soul. There's nothing more valuable to, to a person than his life. But if your value of God, your love for God supersedes the love for yourself, you will even give your life for God. A person who's a patriot, he values his life. But if it's a question, giving his life for his country, where that will make a difference, he will give his life for his country. Of course, due to his patriotism, which is a feeling of pride and love for the country that provides him whatever it provides him for, it's worthwhile to give your life for that, to maintain and retain for even for others, whatever that nation represents. So love is something which is very motivating. You know, there's an expression, if there's a will, there's a way. If there's a will, there's a way. What's will? What is will? Will means you want to do something. You may want to do things for many reasons. You may have ulterior motives. Doesn't make a difference financial reasons, ego reasons, but all that goes into yourself, that self-love. 
even if a person does something because he doesn't want to be punished, that's also because you love yourself and you don't want to be hurt or you want to be rewarded. You do, so, you do the mitzvah for the sake of reward. That's also love. But the ultimate love is loving God for God, as it says in the Shema. We find the two commandments. There's a positive commandment to love God, and there's a positive commandment to revere God. It says, as it says in the Shema, you must love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your material, with all your possessions. And the Torah tells us, you must revere God. Both positive commandments, which is a greater level, loving God or revering God, which level is a more advanced level. So the commentators explain that loving God is a greater level than fearing God, because as I said, fear is refrain. Reverence is, I wouldn't dare do that, because I understand whose word I'm violating. So that causes refrain. However, to be motivated to do, then you need the love factor. That's the motivating. That pulls you out of your seat. That gets you going. Now, it's very interesting. We find that when the Torah speaks about the great flood and how God destroyed the world, and it says, however, Noah and his family, they survived. God commanded him to build an ark. And his family and all the representation of all the species went into the ark. And the Torah tells us, Noah was a tzaddik bedorosov. He was a tzaddik based on the bell curve. Meaning, if comparing him to Avram, he would have been considered ordinary. But versus his generation, he was exceptional. He was only a tzaddik devoutly regarding, compared to the members of his generations that he lived in. But compared to Avram, Avram was at a different level. The Torah tells us, Esel Ukim Salech Noach. Noach needed a support. He needed that special divine intervention to support him, to be able to continue going. Avram didn't need any support. We read in Pirkei Ovos that Noah only survived with his family, but the world was destroyed. Avram, because he was able to address all the needs of the world through his own initiative, God did not destroy the world. Otherwise, God would have destroyed the world. And that's why we read in Pirkei Ovos that there were 10 generations from Noah to Avram. And Noah and Avram received the reward of all 10 generations. Why did he receive the reward of all 10 generations? So Rabbi Yonah's commentary, Pirkei Ovos says, because what those 10 generations were supposed to accomplish, Avram in his own right accomplished that. So because he addressed the need, what, what they should have accomplished, God says it, it's worthwhile to maintain existence because its value is there because Avram provided its value. Therefore, Avram received reward for all 10 generations that he had followed after those 10 generations. He received the reward, the reward versus all of them. Now, you know, most people, 99.99% of people, once they're at the head of the pack, they surpass their peers and they're a certain distance beyond them, 99.9% of people plateau. They plateau. Very few people just keep going and keep advancing, keep soaring. The difference between Avram and Noah was Noach, once he was the head of the pack, he was a tzaddik versus his generation. He didn't, he wasn't self-motivated. Because he would have been self-motivated 
it was only by comparison, he would have surpassed what he what he accomplished. Avram Avidu loyetzer sad. Avram did not need any support. Avram was self motivated, and he just kept advancing and advancing and advancing the last moment of his life. Avram. Avram took on the world single handedly. Avram was born into a pagan world. And because of his love for God, recognizing who the creator was and how beholden he is for all that God provided for him, he dedicated his life due to the love that he had to God, his beholdenness to God himself. And therefore, that was the driving force. But what was the ultimate? What was the ultimate demonstration of love? Which is goes down in history forever, which silences every level of prosecution against the Jewish people. That's the Akeda. The Torah tells us that when Avram was 99 years old, he was told he was going to have a son who was going to be the future patriarch. And he was born to Avram at the age of 100. 37 years later, God says to Avram, the child who's born to you in your old age, who you love, Bring him up as a burnt offering. Do you know what level of love Avram had for that child, for Yitzhak? It's not to be fathomed, the love he had. We speak about after Suri Menu passes away, Suri the Matriarch passes away. It says, Avram was advanced in years and Hashem blessed Avram Bakol with everything. He had everything. He had wealth, he had renown, he had fame, and he had a son. Hashem Beirach as Avram Bakol. Bakol, the word Bakol with everything, is numerically Ben. Bakol is the, is the gematria, the numeric value of a son. Regardless of his all his wealth and all his fame and all his accomplishment, what was what in what area did he feel he had everything? Because he was given a son by the name of Yitzchok. That son was the equivalent of everything anybody could have imagined. He had it all. The son was everything. Everything was subsumed to that son. And God says, that son who you love, who was born to in your old age, I want you to bring him up as a sacrifice. To end his life. That's where he understood it. What does Avram do? The next morning, he rises early hitches his donkey, and he doesn't share with Yitzhak exactly where they're going, and he says, we're going to take a trek for three days. And he's going to slaughter his son to bring him as a burnt offering. It's inconceivable. How is it possible a man who loves his son to such a degree to go because God says, bring him as an offering, he's able to suppress that love to do the will of God. You know what the answer is? Of course, the love for God superseded the love for his son. It's not he had to suppress anything. Avram's love was not to be understood at what level he loved God because he understood God. This is the ultimate level of, of understanding who God is. So this love for his son was subsumed by the love for God. And how was it demonstrated? He rose early in the morning, he hitched his own donkey. How old was Avram when he hitched his donkey? He was 137 years old. A man of his age, a man who has slaves and servants, did he have to hitch his own donkey? If he would have given the order to any one of his chattels, hitch the donkey, would have been hitched. He did it himself. Why did he do it himself? So Chazal tell us, the Midrash tells us, because Ahava Mechalkelis is Ashura. Love overrides protocol. When you consume with love, all that exists is what you have to do. If Avram, even though he's 137 years old, he was a man who had untold wealth. He hitched the donkey himself. And Zor makes it a point. And he rose early in the morning. I mean, he did it with alacrity. I mean, a person understands what he has to do. He can't get, a, get, get out of bed in the morning. 
You go into a depression. Avram was motivated to such a degree. The Torah goes and tells us, Vayashkim Avram Baboker. He rose early in the morning to hitch his donkey. The, he was love driven. He was subsumed by the love for God. When you have that love, you realize you never plateau. You know why you never plateau? Because all that exists in your crosshairs is God himself, is the will of God. That's all that exists. So if all that exists is doing his will, unceasingly you keep advancing and rising and soaring. If Avram was able to address where the 10 generations had fell short of what they should have been, he picked up the slack. And he was able to accomplish what they were meant to accomplish. Noach, he plateaued. Because Noach's driving force was not the love that Avram had. He loved God, but not to that degree. And as a result of that, he was distracted. As long as he was head of the pack, he plateaus. And therefore God had to assist him. And therefore he didn't save his generation. He didn't pack, pick up the slack the way Avram picked up the slack. So we speak about you should love God with all your heart. What does that represent? That's Avram Avinu. Heart is feeling, is emotion. Avram was consumed with love for God at a level not to be understood. He went through thick and thin. He went into the kiln. He hid in the cave for 13 years because he was espousing monotheism. And it was irrelevant to him what the world thought, what anybody thought. All that matters is what God thinks and what God wants. That was the driving factor in, in Avram Avinu. He was driven by that. You know, I always mention, Chazal tell us that the aspiration of every Jew has to be when are my accomplishments are going to be achieve the level of Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov, our patriarchs? That has to be the aspiration and the goal of every Jew. So they ask a question. I've mentioned this in the past. And if you'd say, when will my accomplishment be as great as Hillel the Elder? That wouldn't be enough. Why the patriarchs, Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov? So the answer they give is because, you know, if you shoot for the stars, you go a lot further than if you shoot for, for a lesser goal. So who's the ultimate? The patriarchs. When will my achievements be as great as them? So even though I'm not able to achieve it, but since the goal is a greater level of accomplishment, even if you fall short, the level of accomplishment will be greater. So I explained it differently. The DNA in every one of us is the DNA of Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov. If Avram had the capacity to love God as he loved God, because that was part of his spiritual makeup, and we are their spirit, spiritual heirs, every one of us has a semblance of that capacity to love God within our own with our own capacity. Whether it's Avram, what he was, what Yitzchak was, or what Yaakov was. In every one of the areas of accomplishment, we have relevance to that area of accomplishment. Because our DNA is there, was their DNA. Therefore, to say we should be like Hillel, Hillel's not our DNA. Because he's not the founding patriarch of the Jewish people. But the founding patriarchs of the Jewish people which is the foundation of every Jew, original Jew, who's part of that pedigree, his pedigree is made up of the DNA of Avram Yitzhak Yaakov. So if Avram Avinu had this level of love with all his heart, it's not he suppressed his love for his son, for God. 
But his love for God was so overwhelming and enormous, that love subsumed the love for his son. And therefore he behaved as he behaved. He rose early, although he was, knew he was going to slaughter his son as a, as a sacrifice. Although he knew he was going, he hitched his own donkey. Of course, all that mattered was to do the will of God and just kept going. And he was driven by this. Each one of us, so when God says you must love God with all your heart, doesn't mean to say we're going to be in Avram. But we have a semblance, we have relevance to that level. Because we descend from him, therefore we have that level of semblance to love God in a similar vein within our own capacity. That's Mechol With all your hearts. That's your emotion. There's a question which is asked. We read about in the book of Dvarim, there's a chapter about the errant son, the rebellious son, a boy, he's 13 years old, just bar mitzvah, and he steals from his parents and he buys meat and cheap wine. And he eats the meat, drinks the wine, and he becomes, and the parents become aware of this, and they take him to the court. And they say, our child is a rebellious, errant child. He stole from us, and he purchased meat and wine. So the court realizes, this is just his entry point as a person of obligation, he's 13 years old. The court tells the parents and it tells the child, you realize if you continue on this path, you're gonna create an addiction. And ultimately, if that addiction is not nipped in the bud, you're gonna become an addict and you're gonna to have to support a habit of eating and drinking the wine and the meat. And eventually, you're going to become a highwayman. And eventually, if you can't support your habit, honestly, you will steal and even kill. Because the addiction is going to grow to a point, it's going to be out of control. And let's say, and they give, they flog the, they flog the sun, they give him lashes. And then he becomes a repeated offender. And the only way he can become this, take on this classification, the parents have to bring the child to court, to the Besdin. He becomes a repeated offender. Does it again. And they tell the child, if he becomes a repeated offender, they tell the parents, the son will be put to death. Why? Because since ultimately he's become a murderer, better he should be taken out now before he becomes a murderer rather than become this addict who's going to be addicted to such a point that he'll have to support his habit by committing murder. Okay? So the Talmud tells us that this situation never ever happened. It never happened and it could never happen. Why? Because all the criteria that has to be met to establish this kind of situation is impossible to establish. The parents have to look alike. They have to have the same voice. They have to be the same height. And it shows how, why it's impossible. So the Gemara asks, the Talmud asks, so if it's something which is an impossibility, what is Torah write it? There's a whole chapter speaking about this type of situation. This child from the age of 13 to 13 in three months, if you do this, his parents bring him to the court, he's flogged, he gets, and then he's put to death, and so it's not relevant. What does the Torah tell? It speaks about things that have no relevance to anything. So the Gemara answers, the Talmud answers, to study the portion and be worthy of reward when you study the portion. That's the Gemara's answer. So it is a, it's, it is a quandary and it's difficult. I mean, if you want to receive a reward for studying Torah, you know, you can say to Krishna, outside of the time period when, when you're supposed to say it, you still, you get credit, you're credited for studying Torah because it's verses in the Torah. What's unique about the rebellious child, about that particular portion? 
So Rabbeinu Bachio, who's an early commentator, a Torah explains it in the name of the Rajma, that whoever heard, the Torah tells us that if you have a child who steals from the parents and he buys meat and cheap wine, it's the beginning of an addiction. And if he does it a second time, it means it's going to be an addiction out of control. And he's going to become a murderer. And the only way the child can be convicted, the parents have to bring the child to court. If somebody else brings the child to court, the child does not become, this is not condemned and convicted as this type of child. Oh, parents have to do it. He'd say, whoever heard of such a thing? Parents bringing their own child to court knowing he's going to be put to death? The average person, how would he process this? Immaturity. It's okay. Sweep it under the rug. Because of their love for their child, they're going to delude themselves and they will not leave a stone unturned to put it in the most positive perception, even though it's not reality. They will go in a state of denial because of the love for the child, not to have the child put to death because they, he will only be put to death. They have to bring him to court. They have to bring him to the Bezda. But the Torah says, no, these parents do bring him to Bezda. These two father and mother do bring him. What does that say? It says that the love for God is greater than the love for their child. It's a semblance of the Akeda story because it's unheard of. How does a parent take his child to be put to death? You'll give every excuse to dismiss it for someone attributed to something else other than this. But these parents are able to because they accept God's word as reality because their love for God and the love for God supersedes the love for their own son. So the person who can carry through with this is actually fulfilling the challenge of the Akedah. Just as Avram's love subsumed the love for his child, as much as he loved his child, and he was the future of existence, when God says, bring him as a burnt offering, he rose early, hitched his own donkey, was motivated, did it with alacrity, with zeal, to bring his son as that sacrifice. Avram, as I said, the story of the errant child who's brought by his parents to put, put to death, of a parent is able to minimally suppress that love and his love for God supersedes it, he's actually fulfilling the role of the Akedah. So that's what it means, literus and Kabul scars. Study it and receive reward because you put your, your, you're creating a mindset to what degree you have to express your love for God, that God is first and foremost. He's the first priority in your life. Give you an example, similar. A person has a family, wife and children, and they're called up for duty to go to war, to fight for their country. God forbid if this father is killed in battle, his wife's a widow, the children are orphans. And let's say he could evade conscription. But he wouldn't, because he says it's unacceptable. It's not the right thing. I have a duty to my country. What do you mean have a duty to the country? You mean your first obligation is not to your wife and family, your wife and children? So why does he go? Is because he's afraid he'll be put in prison if he doesn't? It's because his patriotism for the country is going to fight for his country even though he understands that there's a very strong possibility he may not return. So what does that mean? His love for, the, for his country takes priority, precedence over the love, love for his wife and children. Same thing. So it's not ridiculous. It's not something which is unacceptable. This is done throughout history. This has always been done. And that's what God expects. And that's, you must love God with all your emotion, with all your feeling. That the love is at this exceptional level. And that's Avram Avinu. And because Avram Avinu had that level of love and he had that capacity, 
we have a semblance of that to be able to achieve something similar to that. And therefore, what is the aspiration of every Jew? When will my achievements be able to touch upon the achievements of the Holy Patriarch? Avram Yitzchik Yaakov. As Avram was able to display this level of love, which subsumed love for anything but God, we have relevance to that. I'm not saying it does not be developed, but in the core of our being, it's part of our ultimate potential to be able to achieve this. But again, the concept of love is motivating. That's what drives a person. Fear causes, represents, it's not what we're afraid. I'm afraid, therefore I won't. I won't steal, God forbid. I won't commit a crime. So you refrain. Doing is because that's, you have to be incentivized. You have to be driven. You have to be motivated. That's love. So I say, I say is positive is love. Negative is what is reverence, fear. <laughs>